we're going to take this time to celebrate just how Je just how good to us Jesus is with communion this morning. And um, ultimately, I have a few things to say about it. But this is what it comes down to, is how good Jesus is. Amen. Lord, you are so good to us. You are so good, Jesus. You know, I was looking at a couple of accounts of the Last Supper out of kind of matching up Matthew chapter 26 and John 13, because they all kind of hold different details from that event. And some of them deal more with uh, what happened with Judas. Some of them deal more with maybe even like in John chapter 13, including washing the disciples' feet. But when you put it all together, there's this, this order of things where Jesus had this divine provision for them to even have a place to celebrate the Last Supper together. And then not only that, Jesus got down and, and he washed their feet to prepare them. And that, that little conversation that Jesus has with Peter is so telling because here's Jesus, who Peter knows is the Messiah. He's made that confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus has confirmed it to him. He said, you're right, Peter. And upon that truth, your, your name is Peter. You're this... You're, which means small stone, right? But he said, upon that foundation, that giant rock of truth, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, he said, on that, I'm going to build my church. And then later on, you hear Peter, when he writes his epistle to the church, he said, all of us, like little living stones, are being built together to make this habitation for the Holy Spirit. So Peter's had this incredible experience with the Lord, and now the same one who he fully knows is the Messiah gets down and starts to wash his feet. And Peter's like, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus is like, if I don't wash you, you have no part in my kingdom. And then Peter says, well, then not just my feet also, but my whole body. And it's like, Peter, just listen. <laughs> Jesus knows what he's doing, right? He's like, no, you don't need to have your whole body. If you've already been washed, you don't need your whole body washed again, but you just need a touch-up sometimes because you walk through this world and you pick up some trash, don't you? Sometimes you pick up some sin. Sometimes you, you know, but honestly, I feel like if there's an emphasis on this from the Holy Spirit today, it's not in the picking up of sin, but I feel like it's almost in the area of like picking up of despair. You know, I think you can, you can get so infiltrated with the news of today and with the pandemic news and all of the stuff that's going on, whether it's, you know, Afghanistan or elections or all these things. And it's just this constant barrage of that type of information that it can just it can just sort of invade your soul. So that's where, that's where your mind is always at. And I'm telling you that that is another thing where if we come to Jesus today, it's like, Lord, I've just picked up some things in this life that aren't good for me. Would you wash those from me today? You know, and another thing that happened there too was still numbered among the 12 was the one called Judas. Judas. And if you actually kind of lay it out sequentially, like I said, piecing together Matthew and John's account, I'm pretty sure that Jesus identified Judas and told him what you're going to do, go do it quickly, before then he celebrated the Passover with the remaining 11. And I love how Jesus did that. Not only did he cleanse them from the stuff, but he, he identified something among them that wasn't well. And he got that out of the way before he celebrated that with them. Whenever I take communion, I like to do so with expectation. Obviously, we do this to celebrate Jesus. We do this in remembrance of Jesus. And if you're here with us and you haven't been here for communion before, I want you to know you are so welcome to take communion with us. It's not a closed communion like 
you have to be a member of the church or anything like that. You are welcome to take communion with us. But I like to do so with expectation. And if there's just, if there's something you've picked up, if there's something that is just, you know, it's just like it's clinging onto you and you can't get rid of it, it could be a sin or it could just be an attitude or it could just be like depression or despair or whatever it is that's just latching onto you. Let's leave it with Jesus today. Amen. Amen. Well, let's let's get that top little layer peeled off there. Such a challenge. Lord, we are we are suffering for you today, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken and beaten and bruised, Lord, and had stripes laid on it from whips, Lord, all for our healing, Jesus. Physical healing, sure. Healing for the soul, absolutely, Lord. Whatever it is we need, Jesus, you can do it, Lord. So we thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for the just the hope and even the expectation we get to have as we celebrate you and what you've done for us today, Jesus. Bless this bread, Lord, we pray. God, may it just, may this act of worship accomplish everything you want it to do in this time, Jesus. Amen. In the same way, it says that Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it and he said, this represents my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Aren't you glad that you have been washed this morning? Your account has been made clear through what Jesus has done for us. So Jesus, we thank you, Lord. God, it's just a little bit of juice in a cup here today, Lord. And we know that on its own, Lord, the, the element here of the grape juice, it means nothing. But, Lord, what it represents in this act of worship is everything to us, Jesus. It's everything, Lord. So we thank you. We thank you for your precious blood. Your innocent blood that was... That was spilled out to pay off my account, Lord, my debt. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for cleansing us, Lord, for loving us and for bringing us to the Father, Jesus. We're so grateful. In your name, Lord, you can take the cup. I'm going to be reading the good reports. So we're first going to start off with Philippians 4, 8. And in that verse, it says, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So the first good report is for the last few years, I have been praying for my marriage to get better. And the past, in the last few months have been so much better than the past ones. I have a new hope for my future. And that is from Anonymous. The next one says, I am thankful for the awesome husband I have. I know it was all part of the plan of Jesus. We have been married for 43 years and we are more in love than ever. He is my best friend, a good man, a great father and great grandfather. Not great grandfather. Like, you get what I mean? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I am better. I am a better person for having him in my life. Thank you, Jesus. That is from Sherry H. So the next one says, "To all the church, your prayers have availed so much. 
The prayer for my leg and hip has resulted in the fracture in my leg being healed and closed, according to the x-rays. In less than three weeks, when the surgeon had told me it would take six weeks to get to that point. Thank you for your prayers. Love, Larry B. The next one says, God has blessed us with truly incredible friends that we get to do life with. Friends that love Jesus, walk in faith, and show up for their community. They show up often without knowing they are needed. And that is God. That's also from Anonymous. And then, it's so awesome to hear about the good things God is doing. After service, please take a few minutes to fill out one of the good report slips and turn it into the hub. Thank you. We're going to we're going um, to talk about clothes a little bit today. You know, I was I was dealing with this message and you know, kind of the analogy of clothing that the Bible uses repeatedly in places. And um, and what to put off, what to put back on. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 if you're wanting to look that up so you can follow along today. But um, last night I was still thinking of a title for the message. And we had some kids over at the house. And, um, and I thought of this title for the message. I'm like, New Duds. I thought, how old is that terminology? <laughs> new duds, right? Get some new duds. I think, you know, Jackie and I have been watching a lot of episodes of Bonanza lately. And I think it's just started to influence my speaking again. Like, you know, little Joe threw some coins to one of the ranch hands. Like, go to the general store and get you some new duds or something, you know. So I'm like, new duds. There's got to be something better than that, you know. So then I thought maybe of like fresh threads or something like that would. And so so I asked the kids, I'm like, hey, if I needed to like have a message about a about a new outfit, you know, like a new set of clothes, what would it be? And they said, respect the drip. Respect the drip. I'm like, that's a thing, huh? And what's what's interesting is is I have heard people start, you know, like use this term a little bit. And and then when I told the kids how I've heard it used, they're like, no, that's not right at all, you know? So then sometimes I get scared to say the things the kids are saying because I'm like, maybe this is really something horrible and just none of us know it, you know? So I look up the drip and I understand it, you know, to me, it sounds like something you, you know, would need some antibiotics for or something. I don't know, but it's like respect the drip, you know, and, and I saw this video a while back. The first time I ever heard it was I was watching these disc golfers play, and one of them had new shoes, and he's like, oh, man, the shoes are drip. I'm like, drip, you know? That's not even exactly how it started out, but now it's starting to morph into different meanings. But basically, it's like if you've got a new outfit, you tell somebody, respect the drip. So I've tried it a few times today. <laughs> I got ready this morning for church, and I, I go to my wife this morning. She's, like, putting her makeup on or something, and I'm like, hey, babe, respect the drip. And she's like, yeah, okay, you look nice, you know. And she's like, you know. <laughs> so the kids are, like, getting out of bed. I poke my head into their room. I'm like, hey, respect the drip. They're like, no. <laughs> no. Respect the drip. But anyways, we're going to talk a little bit about clothing. So I've titled this message, Fresh Threads, Respect the Drip. Okay? Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, <laughs> says, Since then you have been raised with Christ... Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then verse 5, right in the beginning here, it starts out with a therefore. 
right? So it says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So whenever you have a therefore, it's always a good practice to take a little second to realize what it's there for, okay? When it's saying therefore, it's saying, so in response to what we've just learned, do this. So again, back in verse 3, it said, for you died. How? We died with Jesus, we have been made partakers of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it says, for you died, and your life that now you get to keep on miraculously living, right, is hidden with Christ in God. Put to death, therefore, okay? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So it's talking about like a physical, literal response to what God has done for us in the Spirit. He died for our sins. We have, we have been able to um, receive what he did for us. Like he died on our behalf, so now we're with him in that. We were buried with him, so the old nature left behind in the grave. We actually celebrate that in water baptism, right? Right? The old man being buried, coming up in the newness of life. And, and now we get to live in the resurrected power of Jesus. Since he did all of that for us, now we respond. We respond by putting to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now, Paul is very good at making lists. Okay, there's, there's lots of lists that he gives us in Scripture. So, you know, fortunately, he gives us some lists concerning all these things so that we don't kind of get off track on what is he talking about. He says, when you put to death all of these things that belong to your earthly nature, that would be sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming, and you also, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of these things. Notice that these are things that God is telling us to do, and sometimes we recoil at scriptures like that because we, we so don't want to fall into this trap of legalism or, or get this pharisaical, like a Pharisee, right, type attitude to where I'm going to be good enough to please God. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be able to add something to my salvation by behaving in such a manner. No, obviously you can't. There's nothing you can do to add to the salvation that Jesus has given us by grace, right? It is a free gift from God. But at the same time, God still does expect us to try in response to it. And it's not a bad thing to try for the Lord. It's not a bad thing, not like we could earn our way to heaven with it, but still God wants you to try to do good. To do good things. So he says, put all these things off. He says, you used to walk in these ways when you, when you once lived in those things, but you don't live in that anymore. Our life is hidden in Christ, right? So now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And do not lie to each other. Why? Since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, of course, there is no Gentile, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So it really is a direct reference or an analogy to taking something off like a garment and putting something on. This, this clothing analogy is used all throughout Scripture. You know, one of the most famous places is back when God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he begins to address this, this bad Thing that Israel had fallen into to where they would live like just 
sinners all week long, engaging in all types of immorality. But then they would come into the temple and they would worship and they would give their sacrifices and they would do a wave offering and they would do all of the things. And then they would go right back out and keep living the exact same way. And then they would come back in. This is actually what Jesus is dealing with right out of the gate in Isaiah chapter 1. When he says, who has asked you to lift your hands before me like this? Who is, you know, he says, the smell of your burnt offerings is actually making me nauseous. That's what God says to his people. And not because he didn't, you know, want them to bring sacrifice, but it's because their lives were riddled with unrepentant sin and they were doing this. Of course, God in his mercy says to them, come now, though, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. But later on, I think it's around chapter 7, God's still dealing with his people on this issue, says all of these things you're doing, right? Your acts of worship and, you know, even your giving of alms and money and all of those things. He says, actually, all of those righteousnesses, that's like a, it's a funny kind of, King James and even in the New King James way of saying, like multiple righteous acts. They were righteousnesses. He says, all of your righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? Actually, Isaiah is confessing this on behalf of the people. All of our unrighteousnesses are as filthy rags. And what he's saying is, you think you're doing something good. You think you've clothed yourself in good works. But actually, this just looks like tattered, old, torn up, nasty garments because it's all clothing over hypocrisy. You know, sometimes we don't understand the real context of that scripture about our righteousness being as filthy rags. It's because it doesn't say our righteousness is as a filthy rag. It says our righteousness is. Our righteous acts were actually seen as filthy rags. Now, on the contrary... When you get to Revelation and you see the condition of the church in heaven, it says that the saints are all there clothed in white. And what is that white? It very clearly says, which are the righteous acts of the saints. So, again, this clothing analogy connected with how we're living and what our behavior is, it's all throughout the Word of God. Okay, so... And this is not the only, by the way, crossover reference from, um, you know, that compares like earthly garments compared to heavenly eternal garments. First Corinthians chapter 15, which is known as the resurrection chapter, it compares this body as like this old corrupted garment that someday we get to put off, Right whether it's by way of the rapture or whether it's by way of the grave, someday we're going to put it off and put on a new one that is incorruptible. Again, it's, it's an exchange of something that is messed up for something that is good. Isn't that what Paul says? He says, we shall not all sleep. What he's saying is we're not all going to go by way of the grave. Some in the church are going to go by way of being caught up to be in the presence of the Lord. But he says, regardless of how you go, I'm paraphrasing here, we shall not all sleep, but we all will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, right? The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised. So he's saying, look, whether, whether it's by way of the grave or whether it's by way of being caught up to be in the presence of the Lord, one way or another, you're going to put off corruption and put on incorruption. Okay, so it's this this kind of garment analogy. So he's told us put off certain things. And now he says, therefore, in verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, right? Or dearly loved. I slip back into King James very easily. Dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Again, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
And over all these virtues put on love, which binds all of them together in perfect unity. So up here then, on the next slide, you have your old drip versus your new drip. Okay. So old drip, again, old clothing, your old garments. Paul makes these lists very well for us. <laughs> Someday somebody's going to, like, probably very soon say, you don't understand how wrong you had that term, drip. I'm, I don't care. Okay. Old drip. What to put off? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying, new drip, new clothes, what to put on, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. Now, here's an interesting fact that I want us to keep very much on the forefront of our minds this morning. God has not called you to live naked. And by naked, I mean with a naked soul. And it sounds obvious, but I would say that a lot of times Christians, and probably all of us have slipped into this habit at some time or another, all of us are, as Christians have been guilty at one time or another of spiritual streaking, aren't you glad you came to church today you're learning all kinds of things you're like pastor chris i've never streaked in my life well if you don't count that one college thing right i've never you know no you're learning all sorts of stuff today what do i mean by spiritual streaking a lot of us focus on what to put off but we never get our heads around the fact of what we need to be putting on. And if all you're doing is just putting off something all the time, you're never setting your, or you are setting yourself up to just fail. You understand what I'm saying? I know I'm, I've been kind of joking around a lot in this message, but this is a real thing here, that it's not good enough just to stop doing these things. In fact, you'll never be able to just stop doing those things. When you put something off, when you take something out, you have created a void. And it's like the, the old term or the old saying, it rings true. Nature hates a void and rushes to fill it. If you're just always removing something or taking something off, you're just creating a void that is crying out for something else can't just take it off. You have to put it on. In fact, just stopping doing something is completely contrary to what the real definition of repentance is. When you repent from something, say you repent from anger or you repent from wrath, right? That doesn't just mean I'm going to stop getting angry. It means that I'm going to turn away from that action and turn towards something new. I'm turning away from the enemy and I'm turning towards Jesus. I'm not following this anymore. I'm doing an about face and I'm going towards this now. That is real repentance, not just stopping doing something. Stopping doing something will, will not work. Like say, let's say just for hypothetical purposes, I had anger issues. I don't, right? Ask anybody. But let's say for just the sake of this example that I had anger issues. If I just start out the day going, I'm not going to get angry today. And all day long, I'm just thinking, okay, don't get angry. Oh, this person did something super irritating to me. I'm not going to get angry. Oh, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to get angry. All I'm doing is focusing on the anger and trying not to do it, but it's staying in front of my face all day long, right? But if I say, instead of being angry, I'm going to see if I can do some acts of kindness today. 
where I've made up my mind no matter what, no matter what the question is, no matter what the thing is today, I'm going to respond with gentleness. I may not feel like being gentle with my response. I may not feel like being gentle with this conversation, but I'm going to be gentle today. You will be able to do it. If your goal is to just not get angry, good luck. Good luck. You're probably not going to be able to do it. You have to, when you take something off, you have to put something on. God never calls us to nothing, right? There really is no, there's, I can't think of any scriptural principle where God is just saying, be in a state of nothing, like even in Romans chapter 5, it says, don't you know you're either going to be a, a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness, right? There's no in-between. There's no like, in spiritual warfare, there is no spiritual Switzerland where you get to just like, I'm going to be in the middle and I won't take sides in anything and I'm just going to remain neutral. That is not an option for us. There's never like nothing with God. There's never an emptiness with God. Even our concept of, of things like meditation, it's so different from the type of meditation they have in the world where meditation in the world means that you're just going to, or like in the Buddhist religions or things like that, it means that you're just going to empty yourself of everything. I'm going to empty my mind of all thoughts. I think of those movies where it's like a monk spent 12 years in a cave figuring out how to empty his mind of all thoughts. Well, you were a lot of good to a lot of people doing that, you know? But that's not what biblical meditation is. Biblical meditation means I'm going to stop my mind from dwelling on these things all the time, and I'm going to meditate on the Scripture. See, I've taken something off, but I am still putting something back on. Speaking of, of... Buddhism and Eastern religions, it's amazing to me the stuff that constitutes news these days. I saw on the news the other day that the Dalai Lama ordered his first pizza ever. I was like, who cares? <laughs> he walks into this pizza parlor and he says, make me one with everything. too much. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> We're not just putting things off. We're not just stopping bad behavior. We're putting on what God has called us to put on. Now, I want to close with this last point. Um, there's another famous list that Paul gives us and it's in Ephesians chapter 6. We're all very familiar with it. And it's known as the armor of God, right? And of course, you know, I was thinking about it since we are doing these like kind of updated terms and all this stuff in this message. What would be like more of a present day reference for some of these things? You know, every time you, you hear the armor of God taught about, they always show the image of the Roman soldier, right? And how their sandals or shoes had nails through the bottom and that would give them traction and, you know, what their helmet was like and there was no armor on the back. And I get all that. For their present day, that was the image that would have spoke to them, right? For us, it would look a little bit different. I was thinking, you know, as far as a belt of truth, they would have some sort of belt that's all set up with gears, something. And then, you know, they would have some sort of body armor of righteousness, like the breastplate of righteousness, you know, and some sort of combat boots or something, you know, that would protect them and that would be being shod with the gospel of peace and having some sort of like riot shield or something of faith you can almost kind of get an image of what it would look like and then of course a helmet of salvation and then i left the sword of the spirit alone because that's the word of god right but that has this list of this armor 
all of us fully embrace the fact that the armor of God is something that needs to be put on routinely. But sometimes we treat these other lists like they're one and done. And I would say that they are not a one and done thing. Like I hear routinely people will come up and they're like, you know, I'm just focusing on armoring up every morning. Every single morning, I'm just going to get the armor of God on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take up the sword of the spirit and, you know, the shield of faith. And I'm going to quench fiery darts. And, you know, Lord, today I just claim your belt of truth and all of these things. You know, it's like I'm putting on the armor every day. When you think about any imagery of a soldier that's wearing armor, understand this. They all have clothes on underneath that armor. Even the picture of the Roman soldier you know, yes, he's got a chest plate on and a helmet and things, but he has other clothes on underneath it. In fact, you know, Jan and I were talking about it after service, that clothing actually aids in working with that armor and keeps the armor from maybe damaging the body. And, you know, it's like they work together as a whole thing. I would say that, yes, daily, sure, put on the armor of God. I wouldn't marginalize that in any way. But there are some other things that we should be putting on daily, too, that we should be putting on. And I put a list here of, like, being fully clothed, that God's Word doesn't tell us just to put on things that have to do with doing spiritual warfare, but there's some other things that should go on, too, some things that are going to guard your own soul, compassion, kindness, Humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love. And then, yes, once you're clothed with all of these things, then, yes, put on the armor. But there's a lot of things that go into being ready to live for the kingdom. You know what I'm saying? Now, I know it sounds like a lot of stuff when you start thinking about that. Like, that's a big list. And what are you going to do? Like, every morning, pray through the whole list. I don't know that you have to do that, but actually, it's not that big of a list. Like, when you think of what you do every morning to get ready, when you think of all the things you put on, I mean, you've got shoes and socks and, and undergarments and belts, and maybe you wear a watch and a ring and a shirt, and, you know, you have glasses on, and all of these things are aiding you to go through your day. There's quite a list of things you do to get ready for the day. So for us in our souls, there's some things that we need to be mindful of as well, not just tending the physical man, but tending the spiritual man as well. What are we doing to prepare ourselves? Now, like I said, I don't know that you can focus on all, you know, dozen of these things at once, but you can set your mind towards saying, today I'm going to be compassionate. You know, what would that look like as you drive around Reading and you say, today I'm going to be compassionate? <laughs> There's a lot of things around Reading. There's a lot of people around Reading just as you're driving down the road where you could choose to have a compassionate reaction to them, right? And it would be a big change for a lot of us. We would be putting something off to put on that compassion. Humility, right? This is something I rarely need to, be, to put on, but anyhow. Humility, gentleness. Gentleness is one that just keeps jumping out to me. It's like sometimes my responses to people are not gentle. I have things I want to do that day. I'm impatient, and maybe my kids aren't moving as fast as I wanted them to move or whatever, and it's like my response to them ceases to be gentle. Imagine that if just at the beginning of the day you just said, no matter what today, Lord, I'm going to be gentle. I'm putting off anger. I'm putting off frustration. I'm putting off that old man, and I'm putting on something different today. It's really not as complicated as as it would seem is it whenever you put something off we got to put something back on for jesus amen <sighs> respect the drip lord i thank you for your word 
I thank you, God, that even if um, we're having some fun, even if we're, we're, you know, looking at it in some new ways, God, your word is so clear to us. And God, I pray that I just this sense, Lord, that maybe there's been times where somebody has repeatedly tried to get away from something and has found themselves still doing it, even just moments later, God. Whether even on Paul's list, there was filthy language, Lord. And maybe they've tried and they've tried and they've tried to, to stop talking like that or stop having those words come out of their mouth. And yet it just seems to be coming back that, Lord, maybe today would give them fresh clarity and fresh perspective on it. That, God, it's not just putting that off. It's putting something on that's different than that. That, God, it's not just not saying those things, but it's choosing to say kind words. It's choosing to say affirm, uh, affirming things to people, Lord. So I thank you for this, God. I thank you, Lord, that you showed us how to put these things off and put on something different. You are good to us, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that... that um, you would use this word, God, to help us and, and to continue to transform our hearts. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Hey, don't forget about those good reports. Turn them in afterwards, right? We're going to have some good testimonies next week. Bless you guys.